question number one, we are provided with the mass of a golf ball. We're also given the force uh, with which the golfer strikes the golf ball, and we're given the final velocity of the golf ball. We can assume that the initial velocity is, is zero here because the golf ball is just sitting on the tee, and the question is asking for the time. We have our impulse momentum theorem, that is the force times time equals MVF minus MVI. We can divide both sides by F to rearrange for T. We have everything we need here at this point to solve for time. Question number two, we are given the force that acts on a bowling ball, we're given the mass of the bowling ball, and we're given the time that it takes for the force to act on a bowling ball. The question is, what is the change in momentum? We can use a similar equation to question one, but just uh, substituting MVF minus MVI for change in momentum, because it's really the same thing. That's the definition of change in momentum. Uh, rearranging here to solve for uh, P on the left side we can just plug in our numbers and we get the change in momentum. The second part is asking what's the change in velocity? Well another way of writing the change in momentum equation is change in momentum equals mass times change in velocity. Rearranging for change in velocity and entering in our values we can solve to get our answer. This is the ballistics uh, test question. We are given um, the mass. I'm going to go ahead and uh, rearrange that. Um, I mean, uh, uh, put that in terms of kilograms. We're given the velocity. The final velocity is zero because the bullet is coming to rest. We're given the time in milliseconds. So I'm going to go ahead and divide by a thousand to put that in terms of seconds. The question is asking for the force that stops the bullet. We can write out our long-form impulse momentum theorem here, and we can rearrange, we can divide both sides by T to solve for F. At this point, we should have everything that we need to solve for the force. In question number four, we're given the mass of a hockey puck. The question states that it starts at rest. After a player makes a shot, he exerts 40 newtons on it, and it takes 0.16 seconds to apply that force. The question is, what is the final velocity of the hockey puck? We're going to use the same equation here, the impulse momentum theorem. I'm going to rearrange this to, um, to solve for MVF at first. And then I'm going to go ahead and divide both sides by the mass to solve for just the velocity final. At this point, we should have everything that we need to solve for the final velocity. Question number five is about a nitrogen molecule. Don't let the scientific notation scare you away. It's, it's just a number. Let your calculator do the work for you. Don't let it stress you out. We're given the initial velocity of the molecule, and then it says it bounces back at the same speed. So for the final velocity, I'm going to use the same magnitude, but the opposite direction, because the question states that it comes back at the exact same speed, just different direction. I want to remind you that the impulse means change in momentum. And we know our change in momentum equation is MVF minus MVI. 
So to solve for the impulse, I just need to solve for delta p because it's it's really it's the same exact thing. That's what impulse means. Plugging in my two numbers here, my uh, mass, um, excuse me, my velocity final and my velocity initial with the same mass. If you got a positive value with the same magnitude, that's okay. That just means that you chose the opposite uh, rep uh, reference frame. So if your velocity initial is negative and your velocity final is positive, you will have a positive impulse with the same value. And that's fine. The second part is asking, what is the average force on the wall? And we're given this piece of information. Let me stop there before I write my numbers in. We're given this piece of information. It says there are 1.5 times 10 to the 23rd collisions each second. The thing that, that jumps out to me about this phrase is the word second. We're given a value of second. Let's take a look at our calculated value of change in momentum. Negative 5.2 times 10 to the negative 23rd. Newton seconds. So my unit there is Newton seconds. Those are the units for impulse. And the question is asking now, calculate the force. So I have something that's in Newton seconds, and I want a force. Well, force is measured in Newtons. So I'm starting to think to myself, okay, how can I get rid of that second? I have something that's in Newton seconds. I want a force, which is just in Newtons. So what can I do to get rid of that seconds? Well, I'm given this piece of information that says there are a certain number of collisions each second. So I can set up a unit conversion here, some way to put seconds on the bottom so that I can cancel out the seconds and end up with just newtons. So I'm going to write this, um, this, this, this provided uh, phrase here, the 1.5 times 10 to the 23rd collisions each second. I'm going to put seconds on the bottom, collisions on top, so that my s's cancel and I just have newtons at the end. Number six, uh, we're given the velocity in the x direction of an airplane. We're given the distance that the airplane is off the ground. I'm going to write that d sub y just to remind you that it's in the y direction. We're given the force of gravity of the bale of hay. Let's take a look at our velocity vectors here. We have 36 in the x direction. I don't know what my velocity final in the y direction is, but I can find that out using this kinematics equation here. Keep in mind that we're solving just for the velocity in the y direction. So every value that I input here needs to pertain to the y direction. My velocity initial in the y direction is zero because I'm dropping it. My acceleration, of course, is 9.8 and the d is given as 60. Once I find my final velocity in the y direction, I can use the Pythagorean theorem to calculate um, the resultant velocity, the, the true velocity, if you will. Um, and now that I have the true velocity, all I need is the mass, and then I can find the momentum. Well, I can find the mass using the force of gravity. If I divide by the acceleration of gravity, I can find the mass of the bale of hay, 17.9 kilograms. I can plug that back in to my momentum formula. And at this point, I'm all set to find the momentum of the falling bale of hay. I'm not going to write out the work for um, my inverse tangent function here. You can really use any inverse trig function to find the angle. The angle that I used was the angle south of east. Question 7 gives us the initial velocity of a car. It's coming to a stop, so the velocity final is zero. We're provided with the time. We're provided with the mass of a child. We're going to assume that the, mat, that the child moves at the same uh, speed and time as the car. I want to remind you of the equation for impulse. We should have, it, we should have everything that we need to solve for impulse at this point. This is the impulse that the uh, child experiences. So to stop the child, you will simply need an equal and opposite impulse. So I'm going to write that as 200 newton seconds. 
Now, if you um, use the opposite reference frame, so your calculated change in momentum, excuse me, so your calculated change, your calculated impulse is positive 200 newton seconds, then to stop the child, you would need negative 200 newton seconds. As long as your calculated value for impulse and your answer have the opposite sign, that's all that matters. Force times time is equal to impulse, so to find the force, we just need to divide the impulse by the time. This is now question number one on the back of the page. These questions, these next seven questions, pertain to the conservation of momentum. In the first question, we're given the mass and velocity of a fullback. I'm going to go ahead and calculate the P here. We have a defensive tackle moving in the opposite direction. I'm going to write down his mass and his unknown velocity here. We can calculate his momentum uh, and just leave V as a variable. The law of conservation of momentum states that momentum before and after a collision must be conserved. Afterwards, we know that there is zero momentum because both football players come to a stop. Therefore, both initial momentums, 779 and 128 V, must equal zero. Once again, the final momentum is zero because both players come to a rest. So we can set our equal momentum. We can add our, both of our initial momentums and set them equal to zero. When we solve for V, we get a negative number. And that's OK. That actually makes a lot of sense because these two uh, football players are running in opposite directions. So we would expect the velocity of the second one to be the opposite sign of the velocity of the first one. Number two, this question is uh, tricky with the wording. You really have to sort of pick apart exactly what's happening here. Think of it as a tank moving down the street and then firing a tank shell. We're given the mass of the projectile. I put that in kilograms. We're given the velocity of the projectile. We're given the mass of a launcher. We're given the velocity initial of the launcher. And the question is to solve for the final velocity of the launcher. The momentum initial must equal the momentum final. So let's think about what we have initially here. We have both masses moving at a given speed together. After the shell is fired, we have two bodies moving. We have the mass of the projectile and the velocity of the projectile. And then we also have the, uh, the tank or the, uh, the, the launcher moving separately. Let's stop here and just digest this equation a little bit. On the left side, we have the initial momentum. That is both masses moving together at the same velocity, the mass of the projectile and the mass of the launcher, because the projectile has not been launched yet. On the right side of the equation, after the projectile has been launched, we have two moving bodies. We have the moving projectile. We also have the moving launcher. They're moving at different speeds. They have different masses. So that's why they have different momentums. That plus sign is in there to indicate that there are two different momentums here. So we have a single momentum on the left. We have two different momentums on the right. But I can set them equal to each other because momentum must be conserved. Our velocity is negative here, which means that the launcher is moving in the opposite direction than it was before the projectile was fired. Question number three, we're given the mass of a rubber bullet. Watch out for the units here. I, can, I put that in kilograms. The velocity of the block initial, excuse me, uh, the velocity of the bullet initial is 150 meters per second. The mass of the concrete is 8.5 kilograms. The velocity of the bullet final is negative 100 because it's moving in the opposite direction than it was when it was first fired. Our initial momentum, we have 
a moving bullet, and that's it. Our final momentum, we have a moving bullet, again, with a different velocity. And we have a moving concrete block. So two, uh, excuse me, one momentum to start with, and then afterwards we have two momentums, the bullet and the block. We can set them equal to each other because momentum is conserved. And now we're ready to solve for our velocity of the concrete final. In the fourth question, we are given the mass of a van. We are given the mass of a compact car. After the collision, they move together at a given velocity. And we need to calculate the initial velocity of the van. Well, momentum must be conserved. Initially, we have one moving body. That would be the van. And after the collision, we again have one moving body. It's the two cars together at a different velocity. My variable here is the v sub v, the velocity of the van, and we can find that. We have another football question here. We're given the mass of a fullback. We're given the initial velocity of the fullback. We're given the mass of both linebackers. These linebackers have different velocities. I will abbreviate them velocity sub L1, linebacker 1, and then velocity of linebacker 2. Notice that my velocities of the linebackers have a different sign than the velocities of the fullback. It's okay to switch them. You could make the fullback negative and the lineman positive, as long as you're consistent with your choice of direction. And I need to find the final velocity. Well, momentum before a collision is conserved. It's equal to momentum after a collision. Let's think about what we have before the collision. We have a man moving in the positive direction with the given mass and velocity. We have two men moving in the negative velocity excuse me, in the negative uh, direction with given masses and velocities. And afterwards, we have a combined mass of all three men, or women for that matter, and we want to know what their velocity is. I'm going to add up my three scenarios uh, in the before section, the initial momentum, and set them equal to my momentum final. All three men moving together with some unknown velocity. I can find that velocity. It turns out it's positive. So the answer to the question is yes. Our football player will score because he's moving in the positive direction. We have a car accident. I'm going to write my, my givens with my vectors here. We have a southbound car with a given mass and velocity. We have an eastbound car with a given mass and velocity. We want to know how fast they will be moving after the collision. While I'm at it, I'm going to go ahead and calculate the momentum here. I'm going to try to keep a decent amount of, of uh, significant figures here so that my final answer is as accurate as possible. To calculate the final momentum, or the resultant momentum, or the hypotenuse, we need to use the Pythagorean theorem. And then to find the velocity, we can simply divide by the mass. To find your angle, you can use any inverse trig function. I like to use a tangent function because you are using only your givens and not something that you calculated yourself, so that there's a lower chance of error. And then with these questions, you really you always want to make sure that it makes sense because it's easy to do silly things here. We have two cars colliding. One's going 11.2, one's moving at 31.3. 
does it make sense that after they collide, they move at 18.1? Yeah, that kind of makes sense. If one's moving south and one's moving east, does it make sense that after the accident, they're both going 15.9 degrees south of east? Yes, that makes sense. Okay, finally we have uh, number seven. We're given the mass of cyclist one here. Uh, we're given the mass of cyclist two here. We're given the velocity of cyclist two here. So let's think about this. We have one cyclist moving initially. The single momentum is can be calculated by doing the mass times the velocity. So I've found the uh, momentum of the uh, of the first moving cyclist here. I want to make a note of something. For my P1, my momentum 1, I actually used the mass and velocity of 2. If you look at my givens, my m sub 2 and my v sub 2 are what I use to calculate the P1. So I accidentally switched between 2 and 1, but for the remainder of the problem, I will be true to my P1s and my P2s. So we have one man moving on his bike, or woman moving on her bike, uh, eastward, that is our initial momentum, and then we have a collision. After the collision, we have two momentums. We have one off at an angle and another one off at a different angle. Anytime we have angles, we need to uh, separate them into their x and their y components. We are given the velocities. The x component of the first one is going to be p1 cosine theta. The x component of the second momentum is going to be p2 cosine theta. We know that momentum must be conserved in the uh, x direction. We also know that momentum must be conserved in the y direction. The y direction of P1 would be P1 sine 60. The y direction of P2 would be P2 sine 60. So now, let's get some equations going on. We need to get rid of these variables. We know that P1 cosine 60 plus P2 cosine 30 must be equal to our initial momentum because momentum is conserved in the x direction. Additionally, P1 sine 60 minus P2 sine 30 needs to equal 0. I'm going to uh, rewrite these over here for you on a, on a fresh sheet. Here's my x direction. Here's my y direction. So now, how did I know that they equal zero? Oh, it looks like the equal sign got um, got cut out of the copy and paste there. I know that the y directions must add up to zero because there is no momentum in the y direction. My only initial momentum is in the x direction, which means that my only final momentum can be in the x direction. So if I add up the two y directions, the p sine in the up direction minus the, um, excuse me, the p1 sine 60 in the up direction minus the p2 sine 30 in the down direction, they must equal zero because I did not start with any momentum in the y direction. So let's define one of the variables here. I'm just going to rearrange the pink equation to isolate a single variable, p1. Now I'm going to go ahead and plug this back into the blue equation, the x direction equation. So I'm just going to use my defined variable in place of P1. I can solve this and I get P2 to be 216.5. I can plug that back into my definition of P1 to arrive at my momentum of P1. So now I'm back in business. I can just do my momentum divided by the mass to get the velocity. And then I'll do that again for P1. I'll take my momentum divided by the mass to get my velocity.